This episode is brought to you by Progressive. Progressive helps you compare direct auto rates from a variety of companies so you can find a great one, even if it's not with them. Quote today at Progressive.com to find a rate that works with your budget. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, November 5th, 1980. It is the day after the Maryland 5th Congressional District has its election. They just re-elected their congressional representative, Gladys Noon Spellman. Not a very notable event. A popular incumbent representative getting re-elected to office happens all the time. Except for one catch. At the time of the election, Representative Spellman was in a semi-comatose state, one from which she would never recover. So let's talk about the time that the people of Maryland elected a woman in a coma and the way that the issue got resolved and the really interesting sliding doors political moment that this set up. So here is always Nicole Hemmer of Vanderbilt and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. And a special shout out to our listener, Lindsay, who flagged this for us. And we do get these like... Remember the time that someone elected X and sometimes it's like a dead person or sometimes it's a dog or sometimes it's whatever. We have this like nice, um, nice little through line Are here. Are you telling me we get esoteric tips? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Political history? Exactly. Um, so we could do a little of who Gladys Noon Spellman was, but I suppose we should just go right to why is she in a coma and then we'll talk about how the election plays out. So I believe it was just prior to Election Day, she had um, a heart attack. She suffered from cardiac arrest, and it put her into a a comatose state. Um, So in part, like, you know, this isn't something that happened, like, two years before. And voters were like, you know, it's been pretty nice being represented (laughs) by a quiet, efficient representative, um, but that it was it was um, something that happened so suddenly in a very, very blue district. And I think that yeah. that matters too, right? Um, there's a difference between like a hotly contested race mm-hmm, um, where mm-hmm. someone is comatose and one where it's like, look, any Democrat will do. <laughs> yeah. And four days, four days. Right. Exactly. Election. So the timeline is right. This is November 4th is the election. October 31st, Halloween Day, is when she has her heart attack. She has it while she's at a mall to judge a children's Halloween contest, oh. which is uh, really kind of sad. Two I mean, scary I don't, costumes. It is. <laughs> I can imagine like having a party and then an ambulance shows up and yeah. rolls yeah. away one of the judges. That's no joke. Yeah, yeah. So she gets rushed to the hospital. And yeah, I think that's the real kind of salient fact here is that people don't really know exactly how serious this right. is. Um And her opponent sort of suspends his campaign. Uh, Others sort of aren't sure exactly what to do. And then all of a sudden, you know, just like the calendar has flipped four times and it's election day. And it's like, well, what are we what are we going to do? Well, it turns out what they do is they give her her biggest victory in her entire electoral history. Um, And one of the biggest wins, like in the whole 1980 election. (laughs) It's the total blowout. It is the quintessential sympathy vote. I suppose. (laughs) Yeah. In a lot of ways. I mean, like people don't know the extent, like we said, of her, of how grave this is. But they believe like, you know, her heart's beating. She just needs a little time to recover. Like, let's push her through and then she will bounce back. And like, I think people believed that's what it was or that it was just a heart attack. And not that like really her brain had been deprived significant auction during that time so you know there was a lot of brain damage that just made this entire episode um hard to recover from yeah uh the vote tally that day 103,140 to 24,728 that is a Mm. genuine blowout and as you said nikki her biggest win ever but it is worth lingering a little bit on her opponent because it Mm -hmm. is this guy by the name of Kevin Igo, who is her Republican challenger. He's one of those guys where every time you see a reference to him, it says little known. <laughs> which oh. is like <laughs> the only thing he's known for is he was little known. <laughs> but, but it is the case that, you know, and this is, I think, a phenomenon worth highlighting. But like in these races where you have a popular incumbent, sometimes it's just hard to get a real candidate to mm-hmm. kind of step up and run. Um, yeah. 
not to say that, you know, a more serious or better known candidate would have won in this moment because there was a lot of confusion and there was this sort of rush of sympathy. But, you know, that's where you hear political operatives say, like, we have to contest everywhere. You never know what will happen. Mm. We have to put strong candidates up and down the line. Uh, This sort of makes me think of that. Mm. Well, and there's also, I mean, I I realize he was little known, but he did show some decency in this moment, right? That he said, you know, we're not going to keep trying to fight this campaign. Maybe it would have been different if it had been super close. Um, But the fact that he created kind of the space for that mourning and that sympathy, I don't know, given the way politics are today, um, there's something kind of sweet about that. Well, I mean, part of me sweet or strategic i mean like i think too like okay this is four days before an election how much more campaigning Mm -hmm. are you doing had this happened i think four months before the you know election maybe he suspends for a day or a week right but um but yeah i think the timing of that you know it sort of wasn't much that he could do either like it's just in poor taste to be campaigning when someone's in the hospital bed yeah And, you know, she was, by all accounts, really well respected. She'd been uh, a teacher and an activist and kind of really embedded in the community for a long time. And, and, you know, by all accounts, had been a pretty satisfactory representative. So, yes, there were were only so many cards that Igo could play in that moment. But I think the fact that he was kind of a, you know, subpar candidate, perhaps, um, plays into it a little bit. But you, you mentioned decency, Nikki. I mean... Maybe I'm reading this the wrong way, but there is this quote from that evening. Okay, so the election happens. She's still in this semi-comatose state. There's, I'd say, more questions than answers about what exactly her state is. So mm-hmm. I think a lot of voters think, oh, she'll pull through and you know she'll she'll go represent us again. At the party that night, her press aide, the Democratic press aide, is quoted as saying, this vote was, quote, a tribute to Spellman. And then he goes on to say... This was a nothing race. It was rainy and ordinarily a lot of people might not have come out, but then people did come out and they made a special effort to come out. But just the fact that he was like dismissing this as, as, a, as a nothing burger race and that people weren't going to come out anyway. And so isn't it cool that a bunch of people showed up? I mean, it's like, shouldn't your press representative be hyping you up a little bit more? We fought hard. Yeah, yeah. The fact that he refers so to it bad. as a nothing race and the fact that it was rainy probably meant that no one would have shown up. Um, I don't know. You're used to hearing my voice on the world, bringing you interviews from around the globe. And you hear me reporting environment and climate news. I'm Carolyn Beeler. And I'm Marco Werman. We're now with you hosting the world together. More global journalism with a fresh new sound. Listen to the world on your local public radio station and wherever you find your podcasts. I, I agree that that was a, a backhanded response to yeah. this race. I, I do think that we also see some decency, though, from Congress. Again, yeah. not mm-hmm. a statement we say very often. Um, but even though it became clear, certainly by January, when she would have been sworn in, that things were bad, right? That she was in a comatose state. She had now been comatose for more than two months. But Congress passes a resolution. Um, Obviously, she can't be sworn in, but they continue to um, pay her. So Mm -hmm. she continues to get her pay um, for a little while until they vacate the seat. Um, Her congressional office has support. This is something a lot of us talked about during um, the closing days of Dianne Feinstein's life, that staff does so much of the work that a congressional office needs. And so they were like, you know, she might not be there, but her constituents still need help. We're going to staff that office. We're going to treat it as though it is a seat with an active member in it. And I think, you know, you can talk about what it means to to have a, a seat filled that way. The same thing could be said for um, John Fetterman or Mitch McConnell. I mean, these are Mm -hmm. both men that have either needed to take absences from work or perhaps should have taken absences from work um, and have just had people sort of step in around them and intervene. Yeah, yeah. And and, part of this is, yes, a level of decency that maybe we've come to not expect Mm -hmm. anymore, but also... um, she was well regarded. So there's these really moving articles at the time of, you know, her husband is visiting her in the nursing home and then going and visiting her staff in Congress. And yeah, the House representative kind of rallies and to sort of plant the flag of this 
moment in esoteric history, this is the only time that medical reasons have resulted in the House of Representatives declaring a seat vacant. Um, mm. you, it's I'm surprised by that. You would think, yeah. But um, I, I guess off. You know, people have died in office before, but I think mm-hmm. that the fact that this was this unclear coma comatose yeah. state, um, she does end up passing, but. Not for a while. It's eight years that she's in this coma. And it's a she, long um, time. Yeah, it's a long yeah. time. a long time to be in a coma. She and her husband are buried at Arlington National Cemetery. Um, so to wrap up, though, I did in the intro hint at this political sliding doors moment, which is really, really interesting. So they hold a special election. And who ends up winning that? A name I think most people, not little known by any stretch of the imagination. Who is that name? Denny Hoyer. For people who might not know, he's the he's would become the House Majority Leader. Like mm-hmm. he's a, a big name Democratic leader. And I will say, I don't know, it feels kind of mean, but he beat Spellman's husband, who was also contesting the seat. So yeah. I think that yeah. sympathy vote maybe had dried yeah. up by the time they <laughs> had like, this special listen, election. <laughs> <laughs> You've had your time. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, it becomes a sort of wide open race. This guy, Steny Hoyer sort of works his way in and then he is now the incumbent and I mean we know the power of incumbency he's obviously very powerful he ends up being the majority leader as we've said but you know he's still serving I mean it is just kind of incredible Mm -hmm. this is the moment in which one of the more notable and powerful names in I would say modern politics um, works their way into office through Mm -hmm. this sort of very strange moment how much of that is you know the person's character and how much of that is that this is just a stronghold democratic yes. region and that as you said, any warm body will kind of do and we will keep <laughs> putting you in that position. As long as you are competent, we will keep putting you in that position over and over again. Not not to take away from their, you know, ability to sing. <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we are going to leave it there. Um, Thanks again to Lindsay for suggesting this. That's the story of Gladys Spellman and the story of Steny Hoyer's first entry into elected politics. Nicole Hammer, thanks to you as always. Thank you, Jody. And Kelly Carter Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. Thanks for listening. Our researcher and producer is Jacob Feldman. Our producer is Brittany Brown. Our transcripts, which you can find on our website, are done by Kala Nakua. This Day in Esoteric Political History is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a network of independent, creator-owned, listener-supported podcasts. Audrey Mardovich, executive producer, Yuri Lasordo, director of operations. Thanks to all of you who support this show by being members of Radiotopia. Find transcripts, sign up for our newsletter, find us on social, suggest topics, all that and more at our website, thisdaypod.com. See you soon. Support for this day in esoteric political history comes from Odoo. What is Odoo? Well, Odoo is the only software your business will ever need. Featuring a suite of integrated business applications, Odoo connects your business operations together so you can get more done in less time. Odoo has apps for everything. CRM, accounting, sales, HR, inventory, marketing, manufacturing, you name it, Odoo's got it. To learn more, visit odoo.com slash this day. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash this day. Radiotopia. Radiotopia.